Hello and welcome to the Watchman Live Case with the Watchman AccuCross Integrated Transeptal Technology. We're very happy to see you have taken the time to join us for this unique event. We are online with over 75 viewers and look forward to spending valuable time with you. We thank Dr. Wagner and the rest of the team here at Tucson Medical Center and Tucson, Arizona for their hospitality to welcome us into their lab. The Structural Heart Team has developed a customized treatment strategy, which they will demonstrate today, showing you the unique capabilities of the AccuCross system as an integrated solution that's compatible with watchman sheets with the goal of reducing procedure time and increasing safety. To benefit fully from this AccuCross live procedure event, we ask you, our live audience, to actively participate in the event itself. To do this, we recommend using the chat function on the right of your screen. You can pose all of your questions or remarks that you would like to be discussed in front of the audience. As our moderator, I will pick up these questions and bring them before Dr. Wagner at an appropriate time. Participant interaction is very valuable for an online event, and therefore we kindly encourage you to contribute with any observations, questions, and or remarks. Please note, making recordings or screen captures during this event is not permitted. Also, we kindly inform you that our operators and moderators may discuss or present information on acutist medical products that may make product claims or use techniques that may not have approval or clearance in all regions of the world. Before we go into our live case, we will begin with Dr. Wagner discussing the AccuCross Watchman Integrated Transeptal and his experience with the device. Good morning. I'm Dr. Thomas Wagner at Tucson Medical Center, P. Martin Basker, Director of Structural Heart, the Structural Heart Disease Program Fellowship, as well as Cardiovascular Research in the Fellowship. And I'm here to talk about a transeptal technique using integrated watchmen as well as uh, the acutus system. So we're excited to bring this to you, and uh, we're going to go through a few steps here how we proceed with this. So the Acrocross Watchman Integrated System. Uh, it's been uh, revolutionary for us at our cath lab here in Tucson Medical Center. We are very excited about this. And uh, just before I jump into it, I'll give you a little bit of background about our program. We are currently the top global enrollers in Champion F, which is the lowest Watchman trial. So we do quite a few Watchmen. We actually just uh, have done over about 1,100 uh, to date. Uh, we are in Protected Tavar and wrapped that trial. We we're second national enrollers, third globally. Uh, we are third national enrollment in Restore F clinical trial using a Pella device. And we are in uh, early feasibility studies using mitral, tricuspid, and aortic. Overall, we were the number two busiest mitral program in 2020 in the U.S. during COVID. So that's a little bit of the background about our program. We're going to move forward and talk about how many transeptals we do, which is about 20 a week and over 1,000 per year. So a very high-volume transeptal uh, puncture program with uh, LA closure and mitral and uh, early feasibility study devices. So stepping back, looking at the atrial septal anatomy, looking at the REO and the LEO views, you always want to understand where your fossa valis. I think that's very, very important as you drop down from your superior vena cava into the right atrium, you'll feel two separate bumps. The first is over the aortic knob, and the second then is into the fossa valis. There's a tactile feedback as well as a visual feedback on fluoroscopy, as well as TE or ice, depending on your utilization of echo imaging. Going historically, uh, the TSP puncture was first performed in 1959 to look at LA pressures directly in mitral valve stenosis. It was used for percutaneous balloon mitral valvuloplasty in 1984, uh, pulmonary vein isolation from our EP colleagues in 1998, LA closure in 2003 with a Watchman-like device, and then PVADS in 2003, mitral valve perivalvular leak repair in 2006, TMVR using mitral clip, the first edge-to-edge -edge, uh, developmental device, in the mitral space, 2012 for mitral valve and valve implantation for failed surgical valves. And then finally for TMVR full replacement in uh, de novo mitral valve disease. So using this timeline, we really matured the process of the transeptal puncture and there's lots of different tools and tips and tricks to use. We're gonna highlight the integrated system using the acuitus uh, with the Watchman delivery system. So contemporary crossing profiles and techniques, generally it's under TE or ICE. We are a TE heavy program because we do a lot of valve disease with mitrals. We do ICE occasionally as well as fusion with ICE TE and even CT. Rarely do we ever use plain old radiography. I think most centers have gone away with that, although it may come back into vogue in the future with more ICE and uh, integrated imaging techniques. So looking at it from a historical standpoint, the TSB by plain radiography shows 
In the ARIA view, the RV and LV overlaps. The annulus of the mitral tricuspid, as well as the aortic roots in a left and non coronary cusp. In the LAO view, you see predominantly the left ventricle on the right side and the right ventricle on the left side and the interventricular septum, which is an important view during ventriculography for VSD evaluation. Moving forward into the transesophageal echocardiography world, we look at the short axis of the aortic valve, and that gives us the anterior posterior anatomy of the intraatrial septum. That is your aortic valve short axis on T, which will talk about the angiography equivalence in the areal crane view. The bicable view shows superior and inferior anatomy and the superior and inferior limbus, and it shows you essentially your height on the transeptal puncture in coordination with the four chamber view, which is used for mitral clip. So here's a 3D uh, iteration of uh, the right atrial view looking on FOSS. You have your SVC at top uh, at noon, you have your intraatrial septum, and then your fossa valves right in the center where that small yellow circle is. Your station valve is on the bottom right, and your aortic valve, you can appreciate usually the non coronary cusp as it comes together with the intraventricular, I'm sorry, the intraatrial septum. So that second bump you're going to feel is into the fossa valves. Here's a 3D rendering of our tenting during our transeptal, which you can appreciate on a nice 3D image cut uh, from the surgeon's view on the right atrial side puncturing of the intraatrial septal catheter into the fossa valis, and then finally crossing. So typically we see the left upper image here where we puncture, we cross, and have a nice smooth intraatrial septal uh, crossing. If it's aneurysmal and it's it moving essentially 10 millimeters to 15 millimeters across from one side to the other from the baseline intra intraatrial septum, it can be problematic and require either RF ablation burning and or uh, balloon septostomy. Fibrotic uh, intraatrial septums can also be problematic. It's thick in their scar tissue, possibly prior surgical repair. Those usually require uh, RF uh, heat, uh, thermal uh, heat, as well as balloon atrial septostomy. So, this is really the meat of the conversation as we move into our cases here in the future. This is the integrated system uh, of the cutis with the Watchman True Seal and the Watchman FXD access systems. So with Watchman TrueSill, there's a single double and anterior curve. It integrates with this system, as well as with the newer Watchman FXD, both a single and double curve. The acutus transeptal catheter actually is integrated directly into the Watchman sheath. Again, either the TrueSill or the FXD, and it acts and has all, has all functionality of the inner dilator of the larger sheath, the 12 to 14 French, and can be utilized for the transeptal puncture as well as complete access to the left heart. What it means, it means there's less exchanges. You can get through your procedure quicker, you can have less wire exchanges, and, and you can do it with real ease of use. So it's a nice upgrade to your watching procedure. You can shave off about five to six minutes. It does improve efficiency, saves procedure time, less exchanges, you retain your guide wire, we use the same O3-2 wire to cross intraatrial septum, as well as to advance our large sheath across. So essentially use one less stiff wire, which can be 25 to $75, depending on the type of wire using uh, more advanced wires, it can be even more pricey. It really does optimize the location. I'll talk to this point in just a moment, and I believe it probably enhances safety with less exchanges, less risk of complications in intraatrial septum. We are ballooning the septums less. We are using less RF energy to burn the septum. In fact, with this integrated system, we've not had to balloon or use thermal heat across any intraatrial septum so far. So this is what, uh, what it's about. Really, if you look at the steps for the insertion of a large board dilator to the transeptal puncture in our standard workflow, it takes about nine separate steps uh, with at least one or two wires. With the acuitous transeptal workflow integrated into the Watchman delivery sheet, we shave that down by about 50%. So down to about four to five steps. Uh, again, improving workflow using less wires and, and likely it reduces uh, risk of complication having fewer exchanges across the intraatrial septum. The integrated needle dilator, again, acts as your dilator for your large board delivery sheet, the Watchman sheet as well as it has an integrated needle to help puncture those fibrotic septums and potentially uh, burn if needed. Although again, we have not had to utilize RF energy. And limited case series, about 41% of the time you have to reposition your TSB catheter for standard transeptal puncture techniques. Utilizing this system, you have a wire in place and it, it really has alleviated the need to exchange the entire system out and flush the system. We simply run the wire back up three or four centimeters into the SVC advance the entire system up as a single unit, 
then slowly drag it back down, keeping the wire out about four to five centimeters as a safety bend so it doesn't traumatize the uh, intraatrial septum. Works very, very well. So uh, again, what we really like about it is you cannot sacrifice uh, or rather avoid sacrificing your, your location, your optimal location. So if you have a posterior chick wing, you want to stick high and mid to mid to posterior. If you have an anterior chick wing, you absolutely want to stick inferior and slightly mid to anterior. Uh, historically, it was taught that the posterior inferior TSP location anatomically on the, on the fossa valves was utilized for a majority of cases. We're realizing that now we need to be more selective in the puncture location for our TSP to optimize our delivery of LA closure devices and even mitral clips. Uh, so this site-specific puncture really continues to improve the equipment and really enhance the safety and efficacy of the interventions. This is from Mayo Clinic team. Uh, and you can see the, the cross location and initial uh, case set was predominantly uh, mid and inferior. However, once we are able to optimize our anatomical location, take an extra two to five minutes, get your prime optimal location, and you'll have a safe transept crossing and have a smooth transition with the integrated system. Again, uh, not to belabor the point, but it really does reduce exchanges and you can get through your transeptal safely in about two minutes using this technique. There's a spring tension safety needle. If you need to burn, you have your RF port uh, aligned as well. And I think we've really cut back on costs as well using only the single 032 wire. It's been very efficient, uh, both with either the mechanical uh, delivery of the system or RF. In their LMR, limited market release, you can appreciate this was well liked by most physicians. Uh, you know, 27 cases, six physicians, a 4.5 star rating out of five. Again, ease of use, repeatability, safety, and efficacy have all been hallmarks of this transeptal system, particularly with an integrated watchman delivery system. Comparing it to other uh, devices that are out there, uh, I think, again, retaining your guide wire is critically important. Uh, using a single guide wire rather than multiple guide wires. Uh, the ability to, to have uh, burning capability at RF if you need it, it's very versatile. Uh, and I think the safety profile using a single integrated system really can improve the uh, outcomes of your transeptal puncture. The why after you cross integrated, I, I think as we just alluded to, reduce further exchanges by leveraging the TrueZone FXD Watchman delivery platform sheets with this transeptal utilizing the inner dilator of those standard commercial sheets with an acutus transeptal puncture system really has been the hallmark of our Watchman program the last couple of months with this integrated system. Uh, there are a couple of little tips and tricks using the wire pullback technique. Uh, it will help the system drop into the fossil valves. I think this is a very important technique. As you withdraw the system, you keep your wire out four to five centimeters and it will help straighten the catheter. When you pull back, it bends the catheter and it really allows you to have a more safety uh, net as you enter the, the fossa valves without causing trauma or lacerating or renting the intra-atrial fossa. Uh, you can redeploy the needle if you need to fire the needle. If you do uh, have some uh, resistance, we found that gently withdrawing the system, counterclocking, and then clocking the system posteriorly uh, from an anterior uh, location really will help you be more coaxial as you advance the system into the left upper pulmonary vein. Other tips and tricks we find very helpful is that uh, you ensure that the back of the system is locked into the integrated uh, Acupross and TrueSil FXD. Uh, you ensure that you are have your flush port in line with the electric port of the Acupross system. Again, we've not had to use RF at all uh, for these integrated systems. It's been a, a nice, uh, advantageous uh, addition to the procedure, shortening the time, and again, using less wires and, and uh, struggling less of a TSP. You hold the sheath with your left hand and the acute across is built as a unit and you push them together with your left hand, left hand advance the entire system. And then you can advance the wire after you fire the needle with the right hand. It's a very ergonomic and, and natural uh, feeling as you try to cross this large bore system with a single, with a single pass. So uh, further tips and tricks, uh, you release the needle prior to pulling the guy wire back. You want to avoid guy wire catching on the needle. So make sure that you do release the needle as you withdraw the guide wire. Uh, we use the needle just for transeptal puncturing and also for support as you cross. And you can use a 16 French short sheath if you have trouble with the tortuous uh, iliac vein, again, which we have not had to utilize in, uh, in uh, hundreds of cases. So I do thank you and we look forward to our upcoming live case. And uh, we'll talk more about the integrated Accurate Across Watchman True Seal. Thank you very much.
We're back in the cath lab and about ready to start the procedure. Just a reminder, participant interaction is very valuable for online events, and we encourage you to contribute with any observations, questions, or remarks. Please use the chat box on the right of your screen for said questions, comments, and remarks. Finally, before I hand over the microphone, I'm honored to introduce you to Dr. Thomas Wagner, who is the Director of Structural Heart and Cardiovascular Research at Tucson Medical Center and Pima Heart Physicians. Dr. Wagner, the stage is yours. Excellent, guys. Thank you so much, Trey. Welcome to Tucson. We have a great case today using an acuitous integrated system with a Watchman uh, FXT. We're going to do some Watchman cases live. I want to introduce my team. I, the, the most important thing with anything you do in structural heart and cardiology in general is the team around you in the cath lab. So number one right in front of you is Lex. Go ahead and wave to the camera, Lex. Straight ahead. We have Ani. We have our phenomenal imager, anesthesiologist, uh, Dr. Paul Song up front. We have James Mercutis. We have Emily Horner, who's the backbone of our Watchman program as our coordinator. So really appreciate your support, Emily, and I'm glad to have you uh, join us today. Thank you, sir. Absolutely, guys. And we have Dr. Vikram Prasad, our fellow, who will be joining us uh, here momentarily. And so what we have here is uh, an 86-year-old lady who had a prior Tavar. She's going to get a commercial watchman. She had a couple falls and is higher frailty risk. So we're going to go through our usual routine and show you a couple little tips and tricks on the transeptal integrated system we have here with Acutus. So we do our standard axis, <clears throat> ultrasound guide needle axis. Pretty standard. Uh, we do Vascade now, uh, and I think this has been really helpful with getting patients up in ambulatory uh, in a short period of time. So. We're going to go ahead and get started here in just a moment. So ultrasound is so important in structural heart. Any, any transcatheter procedure, I think, yeah, using ultrasound guided axis is, is extremely, extremely important. I'll kind of talk you through the setup of the integrated system and what that looks like. So we have venous axis on the right. We take a six short sheath in. We historically pre-dilated, uh, but generally we have stopped that now. Just use it, aside from a six short, I don't think you need to go anything, anything larger than a six. Uh, welcome, Dr. Prasad. He's our PGY structural heart fellow here. You can take this out right away. We have venous axis. I give half dose heparin at this point. So, Dr. Saul, you give half dose heparin, please. So we're going to run a six short sheath in just to dilate. We get nothing bigger. We'll post close with a nine French sheath and a Vascade MVP. Excellent. So just six in and out. We'll take the 032 wire, our standard acutus wire, with our integrated system. So we're going to do the integrated system. Good. Uh, can we go live on the TE? Let's look at the imaging so we understand where we're going to stick on our transeptal. So it's a broccoli shaped anatomy. It has about a 19 by 28 millimeter perimeter and an orifice. It's a broccoli shape. So we're going to get a good image here. Let's see if we can pull it up on the big screen if we can. Paul's going to go to our short axis and X plane. Oh, you want now? You want now? Yeah, let's see the appendage from a short axis and explain on the appendage to show them the anatomy. This will be the integrated system with the FXD. Yeah, so go to a 45, explain right through a 45, zoom in on the appendage and let's see the anatomy. So uh, do a couple clicks in on your zoom. You can appreciate it as a broccoli morphology. Again, you have a windsock, cauliflower, broccoli, cactus morphologies as the generic shapes. This is a broccoli. Broccolis can be more challenging technically if they're heavily pecnated, which you see here. It's hard to predict if that appendage anatomy is amenable to being pushed by a device. Is it compliant or non-compliant pectinate? You see a large pectinated ridge right in the middle, and that can be challenging sometimes. You can't predict. It's really hard. We looked at it on MRI. We looked at it on CT. We looked at it on TE, and it's hard to predict the understanding of how that appendage will behave. Will that middle pectinated lobe, that ridge in the middle, ride like a pant leg, or will it become compliant and push it to the side and allow us to uh, facilitate a device implant that's coaxial? 
And that's something that we're still learning. We've done over a thousand watchmen. I can tell you it's still unpredictable how compliant or non-compliant a pectinated uh, ridge is within an appendage. So uh, we will know here momentarily. We're getting our baseline measurements. So again, in the short axis, if you look at an LA appendage, if you go to my hand real quick on camera, so this is looking at it in the zero, I'm sorry, this is looking at it in the, in the 45 and 90, fitted within our double curve FXC watch and delivery system. Taking it over our standard 0 through 2 wire, we have Hapto separate in, we have T live, please make sure that's integrated in our large screen. We're going to come up here in a moment under Flora. Introduce it to the skin. Just pan down. We may have a little kink in the wire, actually. Take a look at the septum. Oh, going up smooth. Excellent little wire tension. So now we're just taking our large system up. Just like a mitral clip, you take your large bore system up over your stiff wire. Excellent. So one of the little wire. tricks I find here is that I want to make sure I keep the wire out. Uh, so... I don't pull the wire all the way back in, which I historically would do with a, a non-integrated system. And we're working to get our T images up on our big screen. I can see it on the small screen there. So keeping the wire in, so what I mean by that is keep about five to six centimeters out. So when you pull down the SVC, you're not uh, renting or disrupting the SVC at all. All right, now we're going to come down. So I'm just going to zoom in. There we go. Okay, so what we're going to do is just slowly pull down here. And I can see it on my small screen over here as they work to integrate our big screen. Are they seeing it okay on uh, our live feed? They're seeing TE okay? Perfect, okay. All right, good. We're coming down here. Excellent. So again, keeping the wire out four to five centimeters is really, really important. Okay, and I'm clocking posteriorly as I come down. You can see us on the Echo on bike cable. We're still in, the, still in the SVC. We're coming down slowly here. We're going to drop here momentarily. Good. When I, get into, when I begin to see us drop, I stop here. I pause. I have Dr. Song or Imager go to our short axis. Our short axis? Yes, please. And then X plane through the septum. Lex, is there a way to get the uh, yeah, ultrasound up there? Okay. And he'll find me here momentarily. On the short axis. As he finds me in the short axis, then we'll explain off that, and that shows us our bike cable. I think it's very helpful to have two views when you cross. I love finding myself in the bike cable, pulling down, getting our mid stick. We're going to go mid to inferior. This is a slightly anterior component to this uh, broccoli. And then I'll go to an X plane on a short axis. That's very helpful. There's our wire tip there. He's got to have it up there. Okay. I'm going to counterclock a little bit. I can see we're posterior on the ultrasound. He's got to have it up there. Good. I'm going to pull the wire back slowly here when I'm in a comfortable spot. Excellent. And now go ahead and explain for me, Dr. Song. Yeah, try there. should be a tent there a little posteriorly. Good. And drop your explanation right through the tent. We do want to stick a little in fear, mid to in fear. Actually, we're high there. You can see that. Yep. So we're going to pull down the same position. I'm going to come a little more anterior. We probably dropped a little bit in fear there, actually. Yeah, I'm going to come back and counter the anterior here. Okay, so now you can see us there. A little bit of an aneurysmal septum. We're more mid on the bicable view. A little bit posterior on the AP view. I think, I think the most important, we'll pause here just for a second to just to make the audience very aware, acutely aware that your transeptal puncture is the most critical component of a transeptal left side intervention, whether it's a watchman, ambulate, new device in the LA appendage, a mitral tear, a TMVR valve and valve, any left-sided structural procedure is really predicated upon an accurate 
anatomical transeptal puncture. It's really, really, really important. Take an extra two minutes, get adequate imaging, make sure you have an adequate transeptal puncture for whatever procedure you're doing on the left side. It's extremely important. All right, uh, Eric, how are we doing up there? So we're slightly in fear, slightly posterior. Put a different screen up and then put it back. Switch, see if it... So I'm going to advance it in just a touch, knowing it's a large system. And being in fear may not be a bad anatomical location, given, again, that uh, broccoli has usable depth more anteriorly. I think the anterior lobe of that broccoli is probably where the usable depth is. How about that? What do you guys think of that? progress on the short axis towards mid. So let's do this. Let's show us the anatomy one more time, Paul. So I'm going to pause here. We have haptos heparin before we cross. Go back to the 135 degree view of the appendage. At the appendage? The left atrial appendage, please. Let's look at that one more time and see exactly where usable depth is and make sure we're happy with that usable depth. If it is more anteriorly, then we're going to stay low and inferior. If it's not, then we'll go ahead and, and come a little more mid-mid. <laughs> There you go. Go ahead and zoom on the appendage. Hard to see there, but you can appreciate there is a little bit more usable depth, I think, an anteriorly. You see that pant leg with that heavily pectinated lobe in the middle we talked about. That can be a problem. I think if we favor going on the anterior side of that, that may be the best scenario. So we're going to go ahead and try to take this. Let's go back to the uh, short axis on the septum. Short axis. Yep. All right. We're getting our live feed here integrated into our large screen for the ultrasound. Good. So we're in fear, slightly in fear. We are slightly posterior, but again, there's a small fossa, not a great to area to go more posterior, which we don't need to. I think I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, Looks safe on both views. I think we're good here on both views. So we're going to go ahead and fire the needle. Me Needle's out. Nothing can be done right now. We're going to go ahead and advance the wire. So we're still tenting. It's a large system, so I'm, si I'm simply going to push in slightly with my opposite hand. I have it pop here. There we go. If this doesn't work, we'll burn it. We should be across. Okay. So find our wire. Gotcha. Okay. So we're going to come out of the appendage. But again, this system has a lot of body in it. So we have historically burnt probably 30% of the time using a transeptal. Uh, where we have to do is electrocautery. Um, and I find this with the body of the system, it really has removed that component of the transeptal. We balloon, do less atrial septostomies. We do um, really just standard transeptal crossing. When we try to renegotiate uh, this wire up into the pulmonary vein, if we can. There you go. There that you go. that yeah. should be up there. Looks like your vein. And this wire, it's safe to loop it. If you go on floor, if you look on fluoro, this wire is looped. It's a very soft, floppy end, about, about 10 centimeters. I'll take this loop. It's a safety loop. I'm going to pop it through. Paul, keep it on the septum there. You can see that the tent is gone, so I'm no longer stretching the septum. I'm across. Pin my dilator, which is the acutus. Pull my wire back. And the acutus transeptal and wire all come out. Very good. So Dr. Sign. Song, uh, yep, yeah, exactly. As Eric said, there's a nice double barrel sign. You see we're across. What you can have happen is the septum can stretch. You come to my hands here. Vic, step back just one sec. You can push the septum across and you don't pop until you're almost to the back wall of the appendage. Of, I'm sorry, the appendage or the LA. So this system has so much body, it's a nice smooth tapered transition that when it pops, it usually pops only a few centimeters across, even in aneurysmal septums. So we're going to sweep for an effusion. There's no effusion. Dr. Song is going to give full dose heparin now. We're going to get a sat, LA sat, just for uh, posterity here. Yep. Excellent. Small baseline, pre existing. Very good. We'll keep an eye on that when we give heparin. <clears throat> All right, so Lex is going to go ahead and prep this for us. Full dose, please. Thank you, sir. Good. Come forward to me. You're close to the patient. Come forward. Come forward. Stop. Good. Open to the patient. Good. So imaging was a little bit challenging, but overall, um, you, know, you can really appreciate the system has enough body that you can navigate across the septum without electric artery, without uh, atrial septostomy, and usually on the first try. I very rarely have to remove the system, flush the system, and reintroduce it. I think most times it's usually the first try of the transeptal. Again, taking your time, keeping your wire out about four to five centimeters 
as you pull down from the SVC. That's really, really important. That wire tip, so you don't drag and lacerate part of the SVC. It is a big bodied system. But there's enough body that allows you, once you have good uh, atrial septal contact and you're in the faucet where you want to stick, simply fire the needle and advance the system across and use your wire will go right across. I give it three tries and the third try, if it doesn't, then I'll use electric cautery, which is very simple. Do you have the uh, red cable? Can you hand me that red cable real quick, Lex? If you had to do electric cautery, you simply grab a bovie pen, which costs about $5. This, is a red, this red cord is integrated into the back of the acutus system. Can you grab that acutus catheter for us real quick and just bring it over here? We'll take just an extra 30 seconds to describe this. So whether you're using the integrated system or not, <laughs> this red cord here connects right into the back, just like that. You hook this up to your bovie pen. You plug it into your a generator, 20 watts of cut, one of coag. You Here's your needle, you fire the needle, you anchor the needle down. You press it for three seconds and you burn at 20 watts. It'll go right through the septum. It takes literally 30 seconds to hook up. If, as long as you have a grounding pad on the patient in an area that's not over a metallic uh, body. So if they have a hip or a knee, make sure you're avoiding that. Excellent, so we'll take the pigtail next. We have our LA pressure. Here's a zero on LAP. Here's your zero. Grab the pigtail next. There's our zero. Let's see what our LA pressure is. It will come out. So we're looking around seven, eight. So Dr. Song, you can give a little volume at least. So we'll give a half a liter of volume at this point, we're around eight to nine on the LAP. And that's really optimal. You want to be above 10, right? You know, the left atrial appendage is a super compliant structure. We've done uh, porcine models with our fellows last year. If you're dehydrated, it'll shrink down, right? When you're fluid overloaded, it will expand. It can do that immediately, okay? So you want to make sure that you have a very plumped up LA, your LA pressure 10 at least, okay? And if you're overhydrated, if you're in heart failure and you have diastolic dysfunction, your LA pressure is 25, you also want to be cognizant of that, okay? Those are patients that I will actually diurese for the next six weeks. I'll send them home on their OAC, their low-dose aspirin and 40 of Lasix to make sure that LA has positive remodeling. So the appendage has positive remodeling around the device and there's no gap that can form it, particularly if they have MR. If they have two plus or greater mitral regurgitation and elevated LA pressure, I will diurese those patients to ensure that that device does not have a late leak. So now we're gonna advance our pigtail. <clears throat> Thank you. Beautiful, and if you watch it, it'll go up here above 10 here in the next minute or two with some volume. It's not a delayed response in most patients, even with diastolic dysfunction. We're gonna hook up here to our, our syringe and pull back. Uh, watch your big screens for me, please, on the uh, monitor, just pull that Phillips screen back. So we come to our home view, which is ARIO 25, CAUDAL 25. You can get this off, uh, it can be derived from your CT, but what I do is just go to this every time. This is my go-to. This is my home view, my feel-good view. I know what I'm expecting to see in this view. It's predictable. I base my measurements and assessments off of this. This is the equivalent of the 135-degree view on TEE. So again, for the fellows here, Dr. Prasad just got started with this last week. He's our PG White fellow uh, doing structural art with us this year uh, from Thomas Jefferson. So welcome, uh, Dr. Prasad. Uh, the aureo caudal projection is the equivalent of your 135 degree view on TE. Your aureo crani is equivalent to your short axis on TE. Those are really the only two images you need to understand with the, the LA closure. All right, so we're going to answer our pigtail. Good. Dr. Song, see if you can find us on uh, TE here. We're going to zoom in <clears throat> to 27. That's our working view. This is great. You can see her nice tabard, which usually works as a nice landmark. She has a prior LED stent. So that'll all be very helpful uh, with anatomical markings of when to and where to implant the device. Okay, very good. So let's find us here on TE. Go ahead, next plane. Looks like we're there. Give me a little puff. Good. Exactly what we expected, right? It's a broccoli with an anterior uh, chicken wing component that, that likely is where the usable depth is. So we're going to do our ejection all primed here. Yep. Here we go. Start slow. The small, thin structure there, good, and fill. So nice left atrial angiogram. You can appreciate it's a broccoli, and you can see the filling defect that we thought we saw in CT right around 2 o'clock, just below the pigtail. That is not thrombus. That's not a filling defect. We confirmed no T. That is, in fact, that pectinated ridge that is acting like a pit leg right in the middle. And that will look, up, that'll look like a, a filling defect 9 times out of 10 on CT. So I'm going to pause it here. Eric's going to go ahead and trace it so we have a nice reference for implantation. I can wash out. 
There's our mitral washout. There's the posterior lobe of the broccoli. Draw the indentation. Yep, he's going to draw that so we know that there's a ridge there. And there's our anterior lobe of the broccoli. It's a true broccoli with an anterior and posterior lobe. He's going to draw where we think this is going to land. So if you can focus on the delivery system, it's five centimeters. The diagnostic catheter is six French, it's two. You guys, yeah. And our pigtail is 10 millimeters. So five millimeters for the, <clears throat> the catheter, delivery catheter, two millimeters for the diagnostic, and 10 for the pigtail loop. So looking about 28. 28. So we had 29 on CT, and we have 28 by fluoroscopy. And on T, what did we get, Dr. Song? 2D max was 19. 19. Likely that was probably only one of the lobes we were catching on TE, would be my guess. Uh, Paul, can you go to the uh, 135 degree view again? And let's do one final measurement. You guys can draw an ACT. Yeah. Based off angio and this uh, CT report, it looks like leaning towards that 35 device. 35. I think that was our plan as a 35. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. We'll just do one final image on, on TE to confirm. And again, TE again, using your hand as that model. Knife edge, 45 and 90. Open hand is 135. Again, so here's zero. 40, yeah, there's zero. 45, 90, 135. You open it up in the 135. And that's really when you should measure, what you should base your measurements off on uh, echo. It's a 135 degree view because you'll only measure one of the lobes, either the superior anterior lobe or the posterior lobe, usually in the short axis, 45 or 90 degree view. All right, Paul, how are we doing? So, a lot of dropout here. A lot of dropout on that uh, 135. But I'm pretty comfortable with the, where the pigtail is and where we're going to deploy. So, I'm going to take this sheath up. So, I'm pinning my pigtail with my right hand, loosening up my TUI. I'm going to bring the sheath in here. I'm going to park it right where I want it to end up, which is about right there. We'll keep the pigtail in just as a, as a safety buffer as we're prepping the device. So based on the LA pressure, it was low, Eric. So for the rest of the team, the LA pressure was on the low side. It was 8 to 9. I would oversize the device then, okay? So if the LA pressure was 20, you could possibly squeak by with a 31 device with a deep implant. In this case, we're definitely going to do a 35. LA pressure is low. We want to make sure we don't have a, a posterior or mitral <clears throat> washout leak at the end. So 35 device, please. 35 it is. That's a 35 millimeter device. Temperature indicator is good. Expiration is Yeah, it's kind of hard to see there. But we have a pretty good image on fluoro, and our base CT was uh, pretty good imaging. Um, so I'm pretty comfortable with the 35. We're just going to play this back to make sure we like uh, our usable depth. Like a little more pressure in your pressure bag? Yeah. Lex is just hooking up our delivery catheter here. Got some extra pressure on the pressure bag. We're going to start by flushing out our TUI. Making sure that it's bubble free by tapping on it. Closing down that TUI to a finger tight pressure. And then just tapping forward on the shaft of the device, making sure there's no air bubbles located anywhere along it. We're going to pull straight back on our core wire. Ensuring that the device is pulling back and free and then aligning the device with the distal marker band. Lex is just expect, inspecting the entire device, making sure there's no air bubbles. Okay. Looking great from this angle. Yeah, yeah deep bubbling is really, really important. And we actually will use contrast as we go up through the sheath to beautiful. confirm there's no yeah. bubbles. Yeah. We've had you know, rare air embolisms, but they can happen. And usually they've gone on the right coronary artery as the patient is in supine position. And they present acutely with bradycardia hypotension. So uh, after seeing that once in a thousand cases, we decided, hey, we're going to make sure Looks we good. not only de-air, but we lead with contrast. And I'll show you what we mean by that. So some centers do this, some centers don't. But what we're going to do, our guide is up in good position. I have a little counter clock anteriorly. I'm going to pull the pigtail out nice and slowly. That looks good. Alex is going to pull that. Dr. Prasad is going to hand me the device. It's like a great trajectory on angio. It does. I think our transeptal is good being in fear. We're going to do fluid to fluid here. Okay. Now we're going to switch from saline to contrast. I'm going to get it in here about 10 centimeters, and tighten down the TUI. I'll wait for Lex to go ahead and fill it up with contrast. And we'll look for bubbles. I mean, micro bubbles you see are at least 50 microns when you see them on echo imaging. Yep. Good. Go ahead and fill. Looking for opacification of that sheet there, some contrast before the device. Good. Perfect fill. There we go. So now she's going to pause there, and I'm going to push it through as I advance the 
device, it'll go ahead and advance any uh, bubbles and we'll catch them on fluoro. So pause, all set. Here we go. All right, Paul, coming up. 35 device. Correct. So here, once I get into the screen, you can see my device coming in on the bottom of the screen. Here, I'm going to pause again, do a final look. No bubbles. Eric, you guys look good there. I don't see Looking any bubbles. Good. Lined up nicely. Good. We have a nice trajectory. I'll pause here as well. You can see the trajectory of the catheter, right? So we suck inferiorly. That's going to allow us to get that superior anterior chicken wing lobe of a broccoli. However, when I do advance it, it will begin to verticalize the catheter. We we'll want to straighten up. So when I get about this point, I can feel the resistance. It begin to rise up, and I'll get a gentle counter traction going posterior. Looking good there. Now we're going to, we fell back a little bit. I did that intentionally. I'm going to marry them about right here. Great spot to snap back. Perfect. Thank you. Distal marker band. I'm going to snap back. So I'm going to pin my right hand, snap my left hand to the right. Good. Now we're going to give a little small puff flex, just a really small one. I'm going to start by forming that flex ball. The right, we're right in that pecknated area right now. Good. Get your pucks exposed. Good. Small puff there. Really small. So what are we contacting there? It looks like we're off. We fell out a little bit. Puff there. Good flex ball there. There we go. Now we're in the post here. There we go. So we are just on the edge of the Kumina Ridge, actually. So once we form the flex ball, which is 1.5 to 2 times the diameter of that 5 millimeter sheath, we then have a safety buffer, right? It's like a nice soft uh, you know, balloon on the tip of a stick. You can push around gently and navigate it. Actually use that flex ball to go posterior and counterclock and anterior to get around some of that pectinated tissue. This is a bit of a challenging case because the pectinated tissue, we'll find out here momentarily if it's very compliant or if it's non-compliant. I'm going to loosen up my TUI gently here. Dr. Sun, can you go live again? Try to find that flex ball on the 135. We'll pause here. What was the ACT? 225. 225. Another 3,000, please. Yep. So generally we shoot for 250. 225 to 250 is acceptable. We want to be around 250 if possible. Uh, Dr. Song's going to look for us on that 135 degree view. Still getting some dropout on that 135, but as it's coming in, we can kind of see the flex ball aiming towards that anterior lobe that we were trying to get into. Excellent. Good. All right, Dr. Prasad, why don't you uh, hand that over there so she's going to reach around and she'll take care of that. Good. Just small puffs here in a moment. Hey, All right. Dr. Wagner, we've got a couple questions if you have a minute. Please. Yeah, we're in a good spot here to, to pause. We'll take a question. So the first question from Mr. Jeff Hall. In initial uses, was there any apprehension of using a large bore sheath to go TSP without the eight and a half French sheath to dilate first? How did you think about that? It's a great question. And I was just discussing with my fellow. I think early on, uh, there's a bit of a learning curve, but much less than doing your initial TSP. It, it, if you're experienced, if you're an experienced TSP operator, I think this would be easy to jump into. Uh, it may not be in your first bag of tricks if you're just starting transeptal access. But I would say in the first 10 to 15 cases, this would be something I would step into relatively quickly. Uh, it's actually probably safer. Uh, I think you have more body, more support. Again, you do fewer uh, balloon septostomies. You're burning the septum less. There are actually fewer steps. So I think once you get over the understanding that it is a large bore, uh, it's very easy to adopt. And I think the early adopters have used this now very, very uh, efficaciously. The one tip, though, is keeping that wire out. You don't want to drag this big bulky device down the SVC. You can lift off any old thrombus. So I keep the wire out. Once I get to my bi-cable view that I'm happy with, then I pull the wire back and I clock it posteriorly. I think the learning curve is, is uh, it's steep, but after a few cases, it, it drops off precipitously. Good trajectory here, Dr. Wagner. Nice trajectory. We're going back to the case. Uh, we're live here. Small puff, Dr. Prasad. Really gentle puff. I'm going to counterclock a little bit more to make sure I have all that usable depth there anteriorly. I'm going to form our flex ball here. We're just kind of favoring this middle lobe as I deploy here, so we'll have to see how this sits and maybe a little bit proximal. Gentle forward pressure there. A little bit of forward pressure. And I know that that Tavar valve was a good marker at the baseline. I think we have a bit of a shoulder. And looking at this, I'm wondering if this trajectory is going to be correct, a 31 device may actually be more appropriate. I think we can probably get this to anchor uh, with a 31 device. Can you do a quick uh, compression here? Eric, you had what measurement you have on fluoro or your baseline? 27? On fluoro, correct. It was looking about 27 to 28. Yeah. 2DTE today had us with the max of 19, but we did have some image dropout. Yeah. This device looks oversized, even with a, high LA, or with a low LA pressure that's now beginning to elevate. 
it does look like we've got some uh shoulders on both sides here yeah so we'll try a partial and uh get a little deeper but just how it's behaving would you get there paul 28 28 okay it's 20 percent for the 35 millimeter device yeah. we're looking for that 10 to 30 percent all the way around yeah so let's do a small let's do a partial here and <clears throat> let's see if we can get this a little bit deeper but now we know that how that technique is going to behave so i'm going to bring the shoulders in here resheathing that device back down to a flex ball position perfect there we go great flex ball there good i'm going to try to go a little more counter clock on this Again, I'm getting resistance from that pectinate. It's getting us a touch more anterior and just finding a touch more of that depth. Yeah, there we go. And it begins to drop down as I get to that point. Here come your shoulders. And just some gentle forward pressure. Yeah. Still a pretty large shoulder there. It's I a little think, bit larger on the Yeah, I 45. think a 31 is going to be the way to go with a deeper implant. Just how this is behaving. And that pectinate's giving me a lot of pushback. I can feel the resistance on that. We have a, a, a moderate to large mitral shoulder that would not leave behind. I think we can mitigate that with a, with a smaller device. Again, LA pressure is on the low side, but just understanding now how this pectinate is behaving, uh, I think a, a, a smaller device with a little bit deeper implant may be uh, more optimal. Yeah, it looks like we've got uh, a prominent shoulder here on our 45 coming in, 135. A bit of a shoulder we have compression but it looks like there's a bottleneck that if we went down to a 31 millimeter device as we're seeing more of the appendage here with the device in place we're seeing that uh 31 looks like it's gonna fill in nicely yeah let's break this so we're gonna do a complete we go live next time recapture this here so if he goes live we should see us there good okay so we have the 35 coming out we're gonna downsize to a 31. Again, we did all the right steps. LA pressure was low. We had borderline measurements for a 31, so we favored our larger device. However, now we understand how that pectinate is behaving. It's very pectinated. It's not allowing the device to, to move or push it around. It's, it's non-compliant pectinate. And so we're going to downsize the device to mitigate that proximal mitral shoulder. And it's very hard. It's very unpredictable device. until you actually understand how it behaves with, with the device contact. Was there another question? Was there a second question from the audience? Yeah, so our second question is, why not take advantage of 3D TEE for an in-face measurement? You can, that's another good option. You could do 3D on FOSS. That's, a, that's a very reasonable to do. And then another question is, have you tried locking the TUI around the AccuCross device to help maintain coaxility? Absolutely, yeah, we absolutely lock it down. So you definitely want to make sure you lock it down. You want to make sure the fin is on the inferior at six o'clock and lock the, the system together. Yes. That's a, there you go. Starting to drip on the TUI. It's important that when you advance the dilator, I can cross dilator inside the uh, FXD sheath that you line up the where the cautery cable plugs into the back of the dilator. Uh, it's kind of like a dorsal fin. You want to line that up with the tubing of the sheath to align the curve. <clears throat> Thanks, James. Yeah, that's a very good point. And then you can lock it in. That will lock together with their uh, with the TUI there. Thank you. Here's your repeat ACT. Of note on that TUI and locking it down, we just want to ensure that we're not over tightening it. Um, that could have the struts start to distort. And once we take the dilator out from the acutus, we could have issues with leaking back. But if you just give it sort of a finger tight on the TUI around it. It should hold it, the acutus in place without distorting those actual struts in there. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Good. Very good. So we have a 31 Check. device that's prepped. Looking bubble free from this angle. Looking yeah. great. Bubble free. We're in the bubble free zone here. Good. Fluid to fluid. Excellent. Very good. Beautiful. Feel free to go off with your flush and load up with some contrast. Good. All right. So we're going back live on fluoro and TE, Paul, zero. 31 device coming up. Looks good. We're going to go to 45 and explain from a 45. Contractors. Good. Yep. Go ahead and fill it. Waiting for contrast. I'll pause here. There Great we go. Fill. She's filled. We're all going to do a quick bubble check. Stop. Oh, bubble. Pull back, pull back, pull back, pull back. We did catch some bubbles there. Yep. Here they are here. So that's why we do the bubble check. A little bit of contrast to lead is really, really helpful. Looks like we're deer. Lights up for a second. Let's do a double check here. One quick.
quick flashlight check. Looks good. Okay. Do take two here. All right. Very good. All right, Paul, we're coming back up. So a lot of bubble there. So let's give it, let that seal on TE guys. There's a lot of air there. So let's give it a second, not overwhelm the system. Let all that clear. Again, if you see a bubble, it's at least 50 microns on echo. If you do have this sort of scenario, just pause, let a few cardiac cycles go through and wash it out. If you overwhelm the system, you can have a RCA infarct. You'll see acute hypotension, ST elevations and bradycardia. Paul, we doing okay up there? Looks like pressure's been stable. She was had a resting kind of sinus barrier to begin with. Good. Air's been cycled through. All right, good. So we're looking good here. Great, Phil. The device is device leading is a little leading. bit. Yep, so I'm going to pull back just a touch here. Line Excellent. that device to the disc good. marker band. Just make sure you have plenty of slack here because it's all integrated Looks together. Great. Yep, good. Mm -hmm. All right, coming up. System looks good. Good. We're going to do our distal marker band marrying to the device here. So I'm going to pause, pin my right hand, unsheath it left to right. I'm going to form my flex ball here gently. System's now married up, going for that flex ball unsheathing. Excellent. Good. Your puck's exposed. Looking good. Good. Small puff there, really small puff. So we're caught on some tissue there. So we can get around Great it. flex ball there. There we go. Should be around it there. There we go. So again, the same move. That pec that I could feel resistance. We were kind of injecting right into it. Gently withdraw the system, form the flex ball, which is 1.5 to 2 times the size of the uh, diameter of the sheath. Slowly clock it posterior and then gently clock it count, uh, counterclock anteriorly. That's going to raise it up and bring it more superior. Find your flex ball on the 135 I'm here. Liking that. I like the trajectory here. I'm going to go ahead and give me a small puff, Dr. Prasad. Really gentle puff. Good. We're against the back wall. But again, we're in a safety position with that flex ball. I'm slowly going to unsheath it. I'm pretty happy with it here. Yeah, as you're coming in at 135, again, we're having dropout. But from what we're seeing, that flex ball as it comes in, it's looking like it's got a nice trajectory here. Okay, let's see what this looks like. All right, we're deployed here. Getting a bit of a shoulder on the 45 here. Yeah, interesting. Let's show me that 145, or, yeah, 135 degree view. So we're really getting a lot of resistance from that pecnate. It's a very pecnated uh, appendage. I'm going to go ahead and just do a partial here, Eric, and see if we can get a little bit deeper. A little more interior, interestingly enough. Touch further to your flex ball. Great. There we go. Possibly a little more counterclock, get a little more interior here. It's really just wanting to fall down. So we have to do this tractor trailer technique where we actually counterclock it like you would back up a trailer in the opposite direction. So starting with counterclock on our sheep, and then right before our shoulders come out, we're just releasing that and actually clocking huh. to back the trailer up into place here. Yeah. Taking a look here. So there's a bit of a shoulder there. A little bit less, but definitely still a shoulder. Do we have mitral contact? A lot of dropout, interestingly, on that 135. Yeah. 242, another uh, 1500, please, uh, Hepburn. Interesting. So one thing I like to do is look at that 135. If we have decent imaging to see, is there any room to go further in the appendage? Again, a very challenging anatomy. It's a broccoli with an anterior chicken wing and heavily pecnated with a ridge right in the middle. So far, the shoulder's less. Um, it's tolerable. It's less than a third of the device. I want to make sure we have contact with the mitral side. That's usually where leaks are when we have undersized devices. Thank you. We have additional heparin going in. Very good. Let's do a little injection here, Dr. Prasad. So before we do anything else, I just want to get an understanding of where we're at based on fluoro. Okay. Should we get a crude measurement pre-tug test here? Perfect. Looks like we've got uh, shoulders on both sides. I'd like to see if we can find a little more depth here, but I'd like to see what we're looking at just uh, compression-wise. Right, here we go. We're going to do an injection. Okay. Go ahead and inject. All the way, Phil. Good. Okay. The fluoro there. Eric, there's our fluoro. <clears throat> I like the position of it. Again, there's shoulders, but if you look on floor, we're almost where we need to be. Um, knowing we're not having the best results against this pectinated tissue. 
Based off floor, what I'm saying, it's got a nice shape to it. Yeah, um, the distal shapes. end, yep, absolutely, is a little convex, which shows that we've got some compression there. Based off the crude measurement pre-tug test, we got a 27 for a 31 device, which puts us at 13%. Okay. Well within that uh, 10 to 30%. Um, we've tried uh, partial recapture here and reposition and the tractor trailer technique. I'd like to see if it's possible for us to just tuck in just a touch further if we can find a little more depth. I know we keep falling posterior, but I'd like to go back to a flex ball and see if we can get a little more interior I agree. for it. But we'll try that right here. <clears throat> Another partial. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do the tractor trailer. I'm actually yeah. just going to go straight back. See if I can just get, move the pectinate a little bit more. Back to a nice flex ball there. Good. Counterclockwise touch right there. Small puff. Quick. Do a small puff. Good. And that flex ball. Dr. Song. Go back there. Again, just diving posterior. Really diving posterior, yep. So I need to go on the other side of the ridge. There we go. Coming in a little bit better here on the 135. We're starting to see that flex ball, and it looks like you've got a nice trajectory heading towards that. That looks good, yeah. See on the 135, that's a nice view there. So I'm going to advance it just a touch as we load up our contrast here. A little slack here, guys. There we go, good. All right, we'll try the tractor trailer technique one more time. Now it folded on itself, but it's deeper, interestingly. <clears throat> so go through TM. It's interesting. The device is deeper. You kind of have a bunched up device compression here. So I'm just going to release some of that by doing a gentle, what we call Tucson two-step. And that opens it up and actually made it come more proximal. So 45's got quite a bit of that yeah, device heading let's out. come back. Yeah, we're going to do another partial here. Counterclock again. We have to pick a nice challenging case here, our live case. Good teaching points all around. I'm going to counterclock it one more time to go a little bit deeper. Now we're as about anterior as we can go. The puck looks like it's at a great spot there on the anterior. There we go. That's stuck. Great. That's deeper. Okay. That's definitely deeper. Just keep some forward gentle pressure yep. on the base of that device. Let that night nitinol kind of warm up and have that device just really expand into place and so the IFU is 10 second hold. With this type of anatomy, we love to do at least a two minute hold before we do our tug test. It definitely is a heavily pecnated. These are the de devices that when they get over constrained at the vertex of the device, they can move when those distal anchors are not engaged. We're gonna do a two minute hold and then we're gonna do a gentle little tug and do our Tucson two step and try to flower this device out. Just wanna investigate this mitral side of the 135 as it comes in. It's like we're canted just a touch and just a touch like there was a uh, we're just gonna do our little tug here to make sure we have very flower can you see it it's settled down there okay do you have a bit of wire bias there we yep. return back from the system beautiful we just did a little what we call our tucson two-step we just do a gentle mini tug if you will we just quickly rapid fire three or four little tugs to open up and have the device flower i'll do it one more time it's like a mini tug here okay how's that looking <clears throat> 135, I just want to investigate this mitral side and ensure that uh, we have a terminating gutter versus any sort of exposed uh, lobe. I actually like the previous deployment better, the one where we had small shoulders on both sides. I agree. I think we were more coaxial in that position yeah. there. So we're deeper here for sure, shoulder. but we have a, we probably are missing part of that mitral, just looking at this uh, fluoroscopically. So I'm going to go ahead and just do another little quick partial. I like that position actually better right there. These little partials, just having the device kind of mold into the appendage. Again, it's still a little bit of a mitral shoulder. Do we have contact on the mitral side? Looks like we're improved from our prior position. Looks like still a possible gutter exposed here. Yeah, mitral gutter on the mitral side. Okay. Let's do one more here, and then we may have to move with a different strategy. We have to go just a pat, touch past a flex ball, reform that flex ball just to free us up from that pack pinnet. There we go. Beautiful. Just reforming that flex ball. Looks good. Gentle counterclock here. It's small puff, Dr. Prasad. Pretty small. Good. So we're on the superior side of that ridge, which is where we want to be. We don't fall down too posteriorly. But looking on TEE. 45, we're back to uh, having a bit of that shoulder. 135, it looks like we 
gotten better contact on the mitral side. Let's do a little puff here just to see where we're at. Ready? Go ahead and inject. So we have contact there, it looks like. Okay. Let's go through our pass criteria, just get a sense of what it looks like. So go to uh, 0, 45, 90. Let's see what the shape looks like. You have a mitral shoulder. I think it's better than what it was. Do you want to give us a tug test in this position here? Just a crude measurement. Yeah, we can do another tug. We did one already. Here's a tug. Good. Anchored in there. We have a lot of wire bice on it. Go through 0, 45, and 90. Just to see the shape of the device. You know, the... the Transeptal was, was more than adequate. I like the, the inferior mid transeptal puncture. Now we're just dealing with a, a tough pectinated ridge. We have a bit of a device shoulder. I think we have fabric contact. I think deploying it straight on, we had a bilateral shoulder, which is okay if it's less than a third. Sometimes creating that neo ostium at the true ostium is more optimal if you're slightly, slightly proximal rather than being deep and you create a, a neo a neo orifice that can be a nidus then for drt and a diastolic uh, dysfunctional patient what we want to make sure is that mitral gutter though is covered So what are our crude measurements there? Got 25 and uh, the 45 and the 135, which puts us at about 19.5% compression, well within the DFU of 10 to 30%. Just checking, uh, really investigating this gutter here. Yeah, yeah, I don't like that. You see the gutter, guys? There's still definitely a mitral gutter. So let's go ahead and recapture this. I like everything else except that mitral gutter. I'm going to do a... Possibly doing a little bit of counterintuitive clocking on this. Yeah, let's no, give me a small puff here. Challenging case, anatomically definitely not a straightforward case. Show me the 135. Imaging has been challenging as well. Let's start back here. Good small puff. Good. We could try to go inferior to that pectinated ridge. I think it's going to be more challenging. I don't think there's any usable depth. Good. Paul, see if you can tease that. Zoom on that 135 degree view. We're not able to get the imaging up here. Lex? Okay. So again, I still think we're, we're in the right trajectory. Small puff. How's that looking? So that gutter on the mitral side? Still a bit of the gutter on the mitral side. Yeah, correct. And uh, shoulder on the 45 here as well. Gotcha. Okay. And zoom on that mitral side. Yeah, challenging case. Definitely with the pectinate. We're not having our imaging up here. It's making it challenging as well. I was like, can we look at a dedicated 135? Yeah, just show me a dedicated 135. Right. Transeptal is the easiest part of the case. Sometimes that's the hardest. The integrated system makes it easy, takes a few steps out, and this is, uh, we're saving our time for uh, a nice challenging implant here. Talk about why you switched from the mini to this, your techniques before, and... and I think just making things easier. I think it shortens the time of the procedure. I think you can do a quick transeptal and be in this position, save your case time for the challenges, uh, <laughs> complex anatomy. And with this new system, you're not using the Amplatz wire anymore, correct? No, we have definitely removed that. We just use your 032 wire that comes to the system. Ready? An injection here. Go ahead and fill. Okay. Let's go through past criteria. I mean, the shoulder is definitely less. Imaging has become uh, a little bit degraded here. 
But overall, Eric, I'm not, I'm not totally against it. She's moving a little bit, guys. Yeah, I'd like to see how that uh, mitral gutter that we saw earlier is yeah. looking with color on it. Yeah, yeah. on floor it looked okay. I think we have contact on the mitral side. There's a small gutter, but I think it's definitely better than uh, the prior one. Our shoulders definitely improved, less than a third. It's tucked under the limbus side nicely. So I'm happy with that fluoroscopic. I'm landed where I want to be. I want to be just on the on the uh, right side of the tower valve, which is my anatomical landmark in the REO 25, Caudal 25 projection. So while we're here, can we do one more tug test? This most yeah, recent position yeah, absolutely. just to verify yeah, absolutely. that those anchors are engaged. Yeah. Here's our tug here. We're going to back it up. We'll go live. Here's our tug. Very vigorous tug. We're going to go back. We do have a little bit of wire bias on it. It may actually correct itself, Eric, as we drop it down. That's possible. I agree. I think it's going to cant in our uh, favor, if yep. anything, based off the wire bias towards that mitral side in the 135. Yeah. Tug tests look great. Look like there was no proximal shifting here. We'll uh, grab some measurements and see what compressions yep. look like. That sounds like. great. And they need ACT. We'll get it just in a moment. We're going to deploy. It was 242, the ACT pre? 242. Okay, perfect. Get another 1500 after that. Excellent. Very good. Again, challenging anatomy, but I think with good imaging, uh, you can conquer this case with under the understanding where your usable depth is and how do you get to that usable depth you get it by your transeptal puncture that's the most important if we would have stuck slightly mid to high on this we would be fighting ourselves we would only be selecting the posterior lobe which is too shallow to implant a device um, so i'm pretty happy with our transeptal i see we're very coaxial with our guide catheter we are our trajectory is angled exactly where we wanted to at baseline there's a small mitral gutter uh, that we're keeping an eye on, but I think it's okay. I think we have good contact there. I don't see any leaks so far. Grab out some color in that. And that's one of the challenges of LA closure. You can do a case in 12 minutes, um, but if you have complex anatomy, it can be double that. And just understanding when pectinate is compliant and non-compliant is still something we're learning in the space. Yeah, I think we've done almost 1,100 LA closures, and every case has its own unique challenges. And ways to mitigate those are an easy transeptal, and that's what I love about the integrated system with Acutus. And what you can see in this device is actually thrombus beginning to form in the device. You see on TE, actually, Paul? Huh? There's filling into the device, so that there's stasis behind the device. So recapturing yeah. now would be uh, of a concern without a sentinel device deployed. If you have to recapture this, you begin to see homogeneity and echogenic smoke within the device. It suggests that there's stasis and flow and that you can actually cheese grade some of that early thrombus out when you go to recapture it. So if we did choose to recapture, reposition this, I would take a moment, pause, get renal access, and take a Sentinel and deploy it uh, for cerebral protection. A couple more views to go here in the zero and the 90. So, so far, far, it looks acceptable. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it, despite how much uh, rigor was in uh, getting to this point. We are seeing some shoulders, but uh, as we get to see the device in profile, we see that it's, it looks like it's less than a third of the device and plenty of uh, fabric covering. Yeah, I think we have good, good fabric cover. What did you get for compression there? 24? 24 is all around yeah. so okay, far. Good. Puts us at 23% uh, compression for the 31. So great challenges, great case, good teaching points all around. This is Dr. Prasad's, uh, what, your eighth or ninth watchman in a week? How many have you done so far? Yeah, it's almost 10, actually. 10, yeah, he's been here a little over a week and this is the 10th yeah. LA closure. He's done, I think, what, six micro clips or seven and 16 towers in less than a week and a half. So we're going to keep him busy. A couple, couple of pellet cases, too. I think you've done three or four pellets as well, huh? Yep. Yeah. Eric, I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah, I'd just like to verify this last view here and throw some color on, but I think uh, given the fact that we've fought quite a bit for this position and given the anatomy with the pectinate that uh, isn't as compliant as we've seen, this is, I think, looking nice. I think it's going to serve well. Very good. Excellent. Again, that's one of the challenges of doing LA closure still is, is understanding your anatomy and how compliant and non-compliant it is. There are facets of the appendage that are compliant. You know, the walls, the, the, the valleys are usually very compliant, but the, the mountains, the ridges, those are extremely non-compliant in, in cases that you can't predict. Speaking on past criteria here for the uh, Watchman device, our position looks good. It looks like we've got uh, some shoulders that we've spoken of. We've got a uh, terminating gutter here that we can see in the zero. Yep. Um, our anchors are engaged. We've proved that with the tug test. 
our size has us with a compression on this 31 device with uh, 19 and a half to 23 percent compression all the way around no evidence of leak based off of our color echo as well as the angio that we've seen very good we meet past criteria and, good uh, we're going to take that i like it very good <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and uh, release we're going to go ahead and first uh, loosen up our tui we're going to do eight counterclockwise turns of the device i'm going to hold my clock with my left hand on the system because there's wire bytes i don't want it to uh, flick off which it can do so i'm released on the screw set i can feel the wire bias as i go to release this here Good. So my guide catheter is still contacting, so I'm gently going to push out with the screw set to advance my system off here. There we go. So we're released. Came a little bit more proximal as it opened up, but still acceptable there. Show me the septum. That's our final shot there, uh, Paul. Let's go back to the transeptal puncture. We're going to look for color flow. Go back to flavor two as we pull our guide back across. Good. Just quick color on the septum. Make sure our shunting is uh, left to right. Small. Excellent. Very good. So we're going to close up shop here using a Vascade MVP. We'll take a six short sheath in the J wire. We'll take the six to get it through the dilator here. Then we'll take the nine. So excellent. So uh, very good. Let's go back to the uh, the questions. Any any questions from online at all for us? Yeah, Doctor Wagner. We have two more at this point. We have. How many times can you retract and re-implant the device? So that's a great question for uh, our Boston rep here. Uh, it, in my opinion, I'll give my opinion in a second. I'll, I'll defer that to Eric, actually, with Boston. Uh, Eric, I want you to field that question. Absolutely. So with the Watchman Flex device, we can do full and partial recaptures um, as long as the device is still in the body um, as many times as needed. Our anchors are designed to re-engage into the actual catheter itself. If a device comes out of the sheath, we recommend switching out to a new device uh, size if it has left the body. Um, even though we can flush the system out, we just ensure that we wanna make sure there's no heme left in a device that's a bit on the back table. So if we're swapping sizes, we'll always recommend going for a new device catheter. Yeah, so the point of that is, is when you swap it out, those anchors can get caught on the guide as you pull back in when you do a complete and it's in the guide. So we're gonna be cognizant of that. If it was a Gen 2.5, uh, it was, there was a specific number. I think we did like three, and then it had to come out because of that reason. You want to disrupt the, uh, the distal anchors. Uh, but with Flex, it, it's such a fantastic device iteration. Come all the way out with the gun. That you can do a partial. Uh, and more, majority of the time, you don't have to do a full. It's just a partial to loosen up the proximal anchors uh, and ensure that you have a Flex ball. Then you can reposition it and redirect it to where you need to go your usable depth is the most important understanding of la closures is where can you get your depth sometimes again in this case it's a broccoli it wasn't straight back it was more interior and basing your transeptal puncture on the fact that it was anterior usable depth so right now we have a we change out our large sheath we have a, a nine short sheath in we're just going to hold gentle pressure from 14 french down to nine for about two minutes we're gonna go ahead and give protamine, Dr. Song. How much heparin did we get? So we generally reverse with protamine. We'll hold it for two minutes with a nine French sheath here. So we'll use our, our Vascade MVP, which has worked really well. These patients are ambulatory, you know, after an hour. I'm sorry, how much? 10,500. So we're gonna give 50 of protein, please, and 20 of Lasix. We did pump up early pressure. Final was around 12 to 13. I think you had another question. Yes, please. We'll take it. <clears throat> so what are your thoughts on the transition from the dilator to the sheath? Any resistance due to the step up? No, there's really not. And I would love to, when we're done here, actually, why don't you hold these two minutes and I'll, I'll show the, the team, uh, hold pressure down for two minutes. So we have the guide here. Let's see, grab me the guide, bring that over to this side. And can we focus here with the camera? Yeah, go ahead and flush this out. So it, the, the step up is actually a pretty smooth transition, and I find it more facile to use than, you know, using that, like if you do mitral clip, which is 24 French and 22 French at the septum, uh, the step down uh, and step up is, is easier to navigate than that. Works out very well. That's good. You flush it out for it. Good. Thank you. So we're going to just backload this. So first of all, this is a very rigid uh, body transeptal catheter. 
and it's angulated. I, you know, we used to use VRK1 safe step, uh, you know, 95% of the time until we had started using this system. Now I use this explicitly just 100% of the time. Um, and I think it works very well in even mitrals uh, for TMVRs or mitral tiers. So here, if you can zoom here on the camera, I'm just going to put this 4x4 down here. Excellent. So there is a small lip on the anterior superior side. Okay. I'm rubbing it here. It's very smooth on the posterior inferior side. And that's just by nature of the, the angulation that you have the 45 degree angle. So when you're doing your transeptal, as you go in, you clock it posterior and then you counter clock it anterior. And slowly advance the system in, it it'll almost always will overcome that, that small lip there. This is actually a better iteration than, than their previous design. So it's actually a very smooth transition. With any transeptal system that is integrated, there's always a small lip. It will be on the anterior superior side, on the greater curvature, this right here. So how to mitigate that is you clock it posterior and then gently counterclock counter it anteriorly as you advance it. Usually it does not get hung up at all. It's a very smooth transition. It's got a lot of body to it. Uh, here's the back lock here. So uh, James is just going to point out exactly how to have this. So as he was mentioning earlier, your electric artery port should be in line with your sidearm port here. Make sure this two is tightened down, finger tight. Don't over tighten it. And you hold it together as one unit like this as it's going in. And as you deploy, it's important that the, the, where your hands are. So your left hand is going to yes. deploy exactly. so that you're controlling. And in Just most like cases, it. you see he's kind of have he has control now of both the dilator and the sheath with that hand. Exactly, he's covering both. And then as I fire the needle <clears> here, <throat> the needle comes out, I anchor it, and I advance my wire with my right hand. And I could do it all as a single operator. If I had to do electric artery, I'd simply anchor my needle, keep hook up the red port to the side here, just like this, with my with my needle anchored. My team will hook it up to the electric artery again. Twenty watts of cut, one of coag, three seconds. You're across. Advance your 032 wire and you're across. Then release the needle. If you have a tough time after you cauter, if you do electric cautery, you can keep the needle anchored as you're advancing. But generally, I try to keep it retracted if you can help that. Okay. Very good. Excellent. Let's go back over here to the table. <coughs> Dr. Brasad, I'll step right behind you here. So, two minute hold here. We're going to go ahead and take the wire, dial it out. 50 protamine. Thank you much. Just going to pull a quick ACT for our closing. Excellent. Protamine's already in. That's okay. Though. All right. So let's look at this device here. This is a Vasgate MVP. You can zoom in on this from the camera. It works out very nicely here. Uh, this will close from 6 French to 12, to 12 French. Now to 15. So I advance it into the white double band here. Lift it up, open up the distal anchor, pull back on the sheath. This is a nine French. We're closing from 14 down to nine. Pick the system up, make sure we're coaxial here, not caught on a, on a venous valve. Good tension here, you like that? Holding the silver in my left hand. Okay, looks good. Advancing the orange down to the white, the white up. Holding the green for about 15 seconds. So it's all extravascular. Great for reaccess. Great for large bore veins. 15 seconds. <clears throat> now we're going to strip down the green here, just gently stripping down the collagen. It's looking great, right? That's a 14 French hole. Close it down to a nine. You like that? We're going to close up our disc, gently pull it out, retract it. Our fellow here gets the honor and privilege of holding pressure here for a few minutes. Well, that's it, guys. Thank you so much. Let's go back to the main camera. I appreciate uh, time today. Uh, we definitely had a challenging case, and uh, we're happy to have our whole team here. The transeptal integrated system works very well. Again, that was the easiest part of the case. I think once you have done a few of just your basic generic transeptals, you know, you can jump right into this after probably 10 or 15 cases. So happy with the results, and uh, thank you much for joining us from Tucson Medical Center. Dr. Wagner signing off. All right. I see no further comments in the chat box. Thank you to Dr. Wagner and the team here at Tucson Medical Center for allowing us into the lab and to be able to broadcast a live case. Thank you to our audience of almost 100 members for joining this AccuCross with Watchman live event. We will close the broadcast at this time. Thank you guys, appreciate it.